Things don't always have to be so hard between us. It doesn't always have to be a fishing expedition for something to make you feel better. You're antagonizing me because you killed her and you regret it. I'm antagonizing you because you're not her, and I regret that. I'm really confused right now. I'm not sure what universe I'm in, what alternate reality, what time period I'm in right now. I just feel like I'm falling apart. Maybe it's because <laughs> I've been traveling too much, Dan. I don't know. I talked to this weird looking guy in like this tweed coat with a cigar and he told me to go through this door and I have no idea what the heck's going on now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, can, you need to stop hanging around strangers. You just need to know people that you know not follow what people that you don't know tell you go through doors that's just dangerous it's very <laughs> dangerous there so welcome everyone to positively trek i'm bruce gibson and we have dan gunther as always here how are you doing not too bad uh excited to talk about this particular episode and i know i say that every week but i think more so than most weeks lately i i have lots to say about this episode there's so much going on here really okay this is exciting because i have no idea what you think of this episode we haven't talked about it. we're going to be reviewing star trek discovery terra firma part one let's let's invite somebody else in on this discussion i'm going to open up that portal door and enter in ben robinson ben how are you i i'm i'm good i'm also confused um <laughs> but uh i'm interested to see what you guys thought as well Excellent. Yeah. So Ben Robinson, of course, of Hero Collector, uh, Eagle Moss, they do the ship models and, and books and all that sort of stuff. So thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to have you here. We're going to have you on uh, uh, the next episode as well to talk about all the stuff you do. But for those of uh, those of our listeners out there who won't stick around for that episode or, or maybe just listen to the uh episode reviews why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do and so well i'm a big fan i'm just lucky enough to get paid to be a big fan uh so i've worked on star trek for most of the last 20 years but more than the last 20 years we make the model ships we publish books uh we've just started making mugs and t-shirts so you know we're pretty pretty deep into the into the star trek weeds as it were what makes you a big fan how did you become such a big fan um, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, someone asked me this the other day, and I don't actually have like a first memory of Star Trek. It's just like it's always been a part of the stuff I love. I mean, I guess it kind of gets turbocharged when it becomes a job. So I was, I, I used to run, um, the, I bet some of you will remember, there was like a, a big hefty Star Trek magazine in the US around the turn of the century. I used to run that. And I had this extraordinary privilege of being able to ring up anybody I wanted to who was involved in Star Trek and just say, can I talk to you? Pretty much without exception, they all said yes. So uh, I had, you know, four years of just being able to talk to anybody I wanted to about anything I wanted to related to Star Trek. And I, I carried on enjoying it. So I guess that's a, it's a good thing. That's why I carried on doing it. Yeah, I'm starting to question myself. Uh, Dan and I are big fans and no one's paying us to be big fans. <laughs> yeah. You have to make things that other people want. That's the secret. I mean, I'm sure lots of people listening to this podcast, they should all give you some money for it. They should all contribute. If they're enjoying it, you know, otherwise they're just depending on your goodwill. Exactly. We may be starting a Patreon, so there's a little hint out there, people, if you do want to do that. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that another time. But right now we're here to discuss Season 3, Episode 9, Star Trek Discovery, Terra Firma Part 1. Dan, you said you're very excited to talk about this episode. So because we're going into spoilers right away, go ahead and tell me, what is it about this episode that really excites you? Well, I think on a, on a basic level, it's that it went in directions that I was not expecting whatsoever. Something gains a lot of goodwill for me when it, it's not predictable. I didn't see where this episode was going at all. Uh, I, I was really surprised by a lot of what happened in it. And I'm, I'm being a little bit vague. We'll get into the specifics, I'm sure. But just like every time I thought the episode was going to go one direction, it went a different direction. So that that earned a lot of goodwill for me for this one. Hmm. So, Ben, what did you know going into this or did you already know some things? I knew something that I still can't tell you that makes a little bit of sense of this. Not a lot. 
but I kind of I kind of know what's going on with Giorgio a little bit more than it's been revealed. And that is what what? Uh, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You won't have to wait very long. You, you know, this is why there's only a matter of days before you you get the how this episode ends up, which is the bit I might know something about. Well, great, because you know one of the things I was really surprised about at the very beginning is we delve right into this character from the past. Lieutenant Commander Yor, who was a time soldier, and seeing the old TNG ep- uh, uniform on him was pretty cool. But at the same time, we find out about he came from the alternate reality from the Kelvin timeline. Did I gather that correct? And the, you see, they've been doing their best to tie it all up. So I know that Alex Kurtzman, like one of his things is to say, look, it's all Star Trek and it it's all fits together. I was going to say it's all part of the same universe, and then I realized, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's all part of the same multiverse. But obviously Picard, you know, we picked up on the fact that Romulus is being destroyed by that point and Spock is gone. So uh, I guess it makes sense that we we know where he went. And now we know that people ended up wearing TNG style uniforms in the Kelvin timeline as well. Yeah, I, I love this. I love that acknowledgement. And, and I think this is other than events such as the destruction of Romulus and the supernova. This is the first acknowledgement that the Kelvin timeline exists as a separate entity known to people in the prime timeline at some point. So I, I thought that was a really nice little acknowledgement there. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Maybe if you go back and watch parallels, you can spot the universe. That is the <laughs> Kelvin timeline. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but then this is all explained that he got sick and died because not only did he time travel, but he crossed universes and our molecules are meant to exist on our own time of when we were created. And of course, Kobor points out, well, okay, if this has happened to Giorgio, okay, but you know, we travel in time. He's like, and Kovic is there and he's saying, yes, but you also didn't travel from a different parallel universe. Mm -hmm. So that increases it, which made me wonder, was Lorca starting to feel this way at some point? And I started going through other characters that have traveled time and universes before. Well, there's a couple other factors as well, because Lorca didn't travel time. He just traveled the universe. And also... Kovic does say that over the past few centuries, the two universes have been getting further apart, which seems to be kind of exacerbating what's going on. So, you know, Giorgio crossed universes and then went like almost a millennia away, which I, I'd imagine greater amount of time travel probably exacerbates it. And then to a period where they're further apart. So yeah, she's in really bad condition if uh, all of that is kind of cumulative. Do you guys like that idea? of this getting sick from traveling through time and universes? I think it's an, I mean, I was trying to think of other precedents for it because the only other example there is that I can think of of traveling between universes and time is the, the Tholian web into, ent- into the Enterprise episodes. Hmm. Well, but then no, no body does that. It's only the ship. So I guess the ship's not affected. And also to your point about the universes getting further apart, presumably they are closer together at the time of Enterprise rather than further apart. So maybe that makes you healthier. I don't know. That would be interesting. <laughs> but yeah, it's not something we've really seen before. So I guess you you can't sort of go, yeah, but what about so-and-so? Yeah. I, I can think of two other people that kind of cross universes and times. The two that I'm thinking of are, are definitely not on the same scale. So Tasha Yar, for example, kind of crossed realities and time, if you want to think about it that way. But that was pretty limited. And she you know, we don't know exactly how she would have died had she not been executed by the Romulans. Oh, she does. I suppose she goes back in time through the, but it's only like 20 years. Exactly. Yeah. The scale isn't there at all for sure. Yeah. I've seen other people saying Spock as well. I, I don't know that you can say that he crossed realities when that time travel kind of created that reality. So I'm not. Yeah. So your divergence wouldn't be very great at that point. I guess that's the point is that the universe is split further and further apart so mm-hmm. you're you're further away from home yeah but now with spock yeah to your point dan i mean when he arrived at the other reality it had already been created by nero years earlier oh that's right too maybe he did get this illness and died maybe that is what happened to spock but we don't know but but if the point is that the universes have diverged so if you think there's like a, a kind of quantum resonance as it were that it's like vibrating at a different rate to the universe that you're from. And that's what makes you sick, like being seasick, I guess. If you're only 20 years, 100 years, whatever apart, 
the, the difference in the vibration is quite subtle. Whereas when it's like eight or 900 years, then the vibration is really extreme. And that's mm. why, why you can't stick around. But it does leave, I mean, but if you think about it, Daniels, it, because of the whole temporal Cold War thing, I guess he's going back into a time that he's altering by his existence being there. Right. But then maybe he did get sick when he came back because they say, you know, all those temporal Cold Warriors, just that's when they first started to realize that people got sick. The only other thing I can think of from Star Trek history, and it's, it's, we never got any explanation for this and it's never really seen again is the TNG season two episode time squared where Picard from, I think eight hours is like mentally out of sorts because his polarity has shifted from the time he's supposed to be in or something, which is something they never do again. And I'm like, eh, kind of maybe has something to do with this, but seems strange. Maury Hurley told me that that episode was meant to lead directly into q who mm -hmm. and that they had to change the ending in order to to make it work on its own because they weren't able to film them back to back which is or to, to screen them back to back which is what was meant to happen right. so I, I don't know how it would have been different but it would have been a bit different because of that well and the, if we ever see or identify characters that have traveled time and universes and all that oh well wait they didn't get sick but well, i mean it's to me it, maybe not everyone gets sick well, um, but also Georgia doesn't get sick like straight away right mm -hmm. it takes a while it's like the longer she spends there the more the more un the uncomfortable it becomes and the more she breaks down so uh, you know it, it's obviously a little bit of a retcon but it, it's it's not the most painful one there's ever been in star trek I, I think there's enough mitigating factors that this could be a special case for sure like i think there's enough going into this that the distance the the splitting apart and all of that i think uh, really makes this a special case so dan i want to ask you a question about this i'm not going to ask ben because he's got too much knowledge about where <laughs> things are going so i'm wondering dan do you would when you were watching this were you thinking Oh, this is how we're going to get Giorgio to the Section 31 series. I feel like this is like, look at the writers of this episode as well, right? They're the show, they're the, the head writers for Section 31. I feel like this is taking a step towards that. That's my guess. And I, I think when all is said and done, this is going to be uh, like jumping around the episode. Those goodbyes that Saru and Tilly gave Giorgio, they had a feeling to them that like, yeah, she's leaving. She's going off doing something else. They're not going to see each other again. Maybe. So I don't know. That's my feeling. So I'll, I will now throw it to Ben if you want to have a comment or just say no comment. No comment. <laughs> okay. No comment. Couldn't possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't mean anything, but you know. No. So talking about Giorgio's condition, then her hand is passing through her wine glass and uh, she's starting to struggle. And I love it when Tilly comes over to console her and she still throws the tray of food at her. I am not an evil person or like evil people, but I, for some reason, really enjoy when Giorgio does things like that. <laughs> just I don't know. <laughs> I just find her character so interesting. <laughs> Yeah, she's she definitely brings a different uh, sensibility to Discovery. And, and my video review of this episode, I was saying like she's she's really felt separate from the Discovery crew, you know, like she's not part of the chain of command. She's uh, she came along with them to the future, but, you know, she's just not really a part of the crew. And this is kind of the first time this season that I'm really invested in where she's going and what her story is doing. That said, like you said, I, I kind of love that she throws a stone in the placid pool that is Discovery every once in a while and just like is such an agent of chaos. I, I do enjoy that aspect a bit sometimes, probably more so than I should. <laughs> yeah. And I love when Burnham comes over to her then too, because Burnham almost is like her mother, even though Giorgio looks at Burnham like a daughter. But, I mean, Georgia always needs to be put in her place. It's like, now settle down, you know, stop this. Let's go talk. Stop running around. <laughs> stop killing people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but then we do find out that her chance of survival is only 5%. And Culber says that the sphere data has found that there is a cure on Danis 5. And I also like the exchange with Kovic. He's earlier in the episode, too. And he's just like, you don't even bother. You're not going to find that in the computer. Find something. He's like, oh, okay. 
whatever. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, <laughs> show us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What'd you think, uh, Dan, about the scene here where Cobra is going to use the sphere day and they have to go to Dana's five and about her chance of survival and the exchange with Admiral Vance, who at first is like, yeah, you, you can go, even though Saru's like, no, we should stay here and uh, deal with the problems that the Federation is dealing with. I, I actually really like this scene, most, mostly the, the second half of it. So, uh, you know, Vance almost seems to kind of countermand or over overrule Saru's decision that they're not going to go. And he says, ah, we can handle the Emerald Chain. You guys go ahead. And then everyone clears out and it's just Saru and Vance. And I love this scene for uh, kind of the humanization of Vance a little bit. Like he's been very just, you know, the, the Admiral, uh, not a lot to him not a lot of personal moments but in this one he has some really good solid leadership advice for Saru when he says you know you have a crew member who's drowning and if you don't save them if you let them drown the the rest of the crew will never trust you and I just that moment I thought was really nice to see Vance smile for one thing and also to have that kind of bit of backstory where he says take it from someone who's made a lot of mistakes in his career and, and you can learn from what I've done and, and here's the lesson that I have to give you. I really, really love that. And one of the things I really like about that is that with Saru, you're seeing someone who doesn't really uh, understand fully what it means to be a captain. You know, so if you think about all the other captains in Star Trek, it's like you don't get the feeling they have a lot of doubt. You know, I mean, that, you know, Picard or Kirk or Janeway or even Cisco. You know, Cisco is a captain in all but name before he becomes a captain. And whereas Saru is like, nah, you know, was he necessarily going to be a captain? It's not, he doesn't seem like the guy who's just going to stand there and say, I know what to do. Yeah, I feel like Saru, because he's such a new captain, he's trying to figure out what Vance wants him to do. And is trying to show Vance that, well, this is what I need to do. And Vance is like, well, no, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes you do have to go against what you think I want you to do because you have a reason in your own ship that you need to take care of and you need to be able to weigh those two decisions against each other. Yeah, and you had the whole thing with Saru's dinner party where he's like, okay, how do I do this? It's nice to see those those kind of different beats. You know, I don't think we would ever have seen that with anybody else, any other Starfleet captains we've seen. The other aspect of the scene, of course, that I really loved was, uh, again, with Vance, but this time when he's talking to Burnham, you know, he kind of questions, like, you have to answer this one question. Will you be able to let Giorgio go? And he cites what happened with Arium last season, which I just happened to have watched recently with a friend who hasn't watched all of season two yet. So we have a Zoom get together and, and watch Discovery. And I just watched that episode a few days ago. So this hit really nicely where... Yeah, Burnham isn't able to eject Arium out the the airlock when it's, you know, necessary for the survival of all sentient life, basically, I guess. And uh, Vance kind of reminds her of that. And, and also through that shows that like he's done his research. He's, you know, done his due diligence in in looking into this Discovery crew and their history and stuff. So there's a lot going on here. And I really like that uh, we get that answer from Burnham, like, will you be able to let go? And she says, yes. And Vance believes her and lets them go. Like there's a lot going on, a lot of really interesting dynamics with the relationships here that I, I really enjoyed. When you say there's a lot going on, it just reminds me that there's times I've been on shows where we're discussing the latest episode of Star Wars, The Mandalorian, and my notes are a lot shorter on those. I mean, that's not a <laughs> knock at it, but it just shows how dense the information is in these episodes. I mean, there's a lot going on, and especially even in this episode, there's a lot going it, To me, it feels like it's a couple episodes that have been crammed into one, but it works really well. And the whole burnham Giorgio relationship is really built on this episode and just seeing them in that gymnasium fighting. I mean, I really think Georgia was wanting to kill Burnham at some point, you know, but, but then <laughs> she didn't. I just love the struggle that Georgia is going through that, you know, she's even willing to attack the ones that she loves, but she can't go through all the way. We're seeing that change in her character, which we talk, we'll talk about later, but you know, it's pointed out that she has changed and she's becoming weaker, but do you think she's become weaker, Ben, or do you think she's actually become stronger? I think she's become different. I mean, there's, there's always that question about the mirror universe as to do people behave badly in the mirror universe because it's a bad place? Or is there something fundamental about that universe that makes you evil? 
And I guess what this is suggesting is that it's like you behave the way it's contact. You know, you behave the way you have to. But I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think um, I don't think the show Yo does weak. Uh, right. <laughs> she, she does badass, and you, you're never going to believe that she's this kind of pathetic or sad character. It's just not in her in her wheelhouse. And yeah, when it comes down to it, with this fight, you know, what Giorgio is trying to do is get Burnham to kill her. You know, she's trying to have an honorable Terran death. Yeah, they suddenly got very Klingon, the Terran. I kind of figured before that they were just like, no, it's sneaky. I don't care about honor. I just, just you know, I care about power. But, I, you know, honorable? Nah, who cares? Yeah, and even, even the second time I watched this, and, and again, kind of jumping around, when we get to the Muri universe and, and Giorgio first appears there, even like the, the arms of the outfit she's wearing has that like shaggy black stuff that Klingon uniform arms are. And I really noticed that this time. I'm like, oh, there's some really weird parallels there that I, I don't know if that's what they were going for, but I definitely noticed that. It'd be interesting to see her serve on a Klingon ship and see what that dynamic would be like. Maybe she'd fit in really well. I think she'd fit in pretty well. I think so, yeah. She'd be running the place. Well, before we get to the Mirror Universe, we have to get there somehow. And so we arrive to Danis 5, and it's the snowy, deserted planet that Burnham and Giorgio beam down on. And they come across this man sitting there as it's snowing, and he's wearing his hat, smoking a cigar. He's got a pocket watch, and he's reading a newspaper, and the headline is about Georgia's death. And by the way, this man's name is Carl. I wonder if it was his real name, if he just made it up. I don't know. Who is this guy? I, I haven't read any speculation online about this, but my first thought is, when I saw this, I was like, okay, is this something to do with Q? Probably not, but it's something like that. Yeah, that was my thought process too. I was like, oh, is he a Q? Mm -hmm. he, you know, he seems to be able to manipulate reality and time and all the kind of things that Qs do. That was that was kind of my initial first thought as well. And then, uh, you know, definitely, uh, definitely has those vibes. There's some speculation online and uh, there's some interesting evidence that kind of points toward it as well. Uh, some people are thinking that he could be the personification of the Guardian of Forever which I thought was really interesting. That's a deep dive. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is really interesting, though. The The paper that he holds up, the paper is the Star Dispatch, I think, which is the same newspaper that Spock and Kirk are looking at that reports the death or the uh, alternate reality of Edith Keeler in The City on the Edge of Forever. And this is crazy. On the back page of that paper, at one point, there's a little ad for Edith Keeler's 21st Street Mission saying they've got good soup and their slogan is Let Me Help, which I'm like, whoa, deep dive, City on the Edge of Forever stuff there. So I don't know, crazy little Easter eggs put in by the art department, maybe that's it, but also maybe evidence. Yeah, I think you'd have a lot of explaining to do if it was a Guardian of Forever. I think the art department, I know for sure the art department love, love a little Easter egg. The other thing, the only other thing that I, I thought of myself was his preoccupation with questions and the idea, you know, the Guardian said, you know, long before your son burned hot in space, I've awaited a question. And he says, oh, that's a question. I can answer that or something. So I was like, oh, there's Something there, maybe, but uh, the other comment I saw online was it's a Harlan Ellison estate avoiding way of showing the Guardian of Forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think Harlan, I mean, Harlan obviously loved to sue, but the Guardian has turned up in a few other things. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I wouldn't be too worried about that. I know they have to give the estate a little bit of money if they mention it, but. Uh, but that would be equally true for the Edith Keeler reference on the back of the newspaper. It would have been really cool if the character's name was Harlan and not Carl. <laughs> on, how are you getting? And then you get a little bit too cute, I think, sometimes. <laughs> Maybe. I was, when you say, when I, when I was called Carl, I was thinking Carl Sagan when it's Star Trek. Well, again, I don't think he's a Q, and I think we all kind of somewhat ruled that out, but, you know, he's specific to this planet remember i mean it's like the whole galaxy this is the only one place to go according to the sphere data so he's a writer he's richard danis that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> the one thing i will say as well though is like is this not the most star trek thing we've seen in a long long time like i'm thinking back to the original series we have the amusement park planet we have trelane we have jack the ripper showing up we have 
swords appearing and them fighting in Day of the Dove. Like this this guy sitting in the middle of a field with a tweed jacket and a bowler hat and and cigar with a door. Like it's just so Star Trek to me, you know, thinking of like John Delancey as Q and all the really wild out there stuff. This just fits perfectly with that, I think. Yeah, I got Star Trek vibes from that as soon as I saw it and Doctor Who vibes from it. Yeah, so. that too. Absolutely. Especially the door. So what do you think's behind that door? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Doors to reality. Yes. So Georgia walks through the door and boom, she's on the ISS Discovery in the Mirror Universe. So Dan, you were saying there was a lot of things here that you weren't expecting and surprised by. Did you expect her to walk into the Mirror Universe? That, no, I, I honestly, at this point, I had no idea what to expect. I, I was, yeah, I was surprised that she finds herself back in the Mirror Universe, but also back in time, back before uh, the whole coup with Lorca and all the th- stuff we saw in season one of Discovery. Really interesting choice, if for no other reason than to show off those amazing costumes uh, that Gersha Phillips came up with for the Mirror Universe and to show us some new ones as well. So that was incredible. I, I love that whole aesthetic that they came up with for the Discovery Mirror Universe. And I had no idea where the story was going. And I still have no idea where it's going at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, Ben does, but we're not going to ask him that. But what <laughs> I will ask him is what do you feel about the representation of the mirror universe as it's depicted in Star Trek Discovery? That's a re- that is a really interesting thing because the mirror universe is obviously it's this classic episode of the original series and it, it's all kind of like oh okay people with goatees in a place where everything's really nasty and then obviously people have had this desire to expand on it so going backwards and trying to sort of see what it was like before because I'm such a kind of continuity guy I'm like trying to go okay so how do they get from here to mirror mirror you know it's like okay those costumes I guess they're just different on the the ISS Enterprise I mean I've enjoyed the mirror universe stuff and and in fact if you know a bit about Brian Fuller's original plans that was like baked into the concept of discovery from the beginning there was going to be a whole thing where they accidentally discover the mirror universe when they're experimenting with the spore drive. Basically, they're trying to find find a way of, of going really fast and punch a hole in universes. And the mirror universe turned up in like episode two of Discovery in the original plan. Um, so it's always been kind of core to the concept of Discovery. I guess what makes you who you are. That's kind of, I, I admit, I didn't think we'd see it again. That's that's interesting. And, and I'm still not sure if we are because Giorgio has presumably already altered her own past. Mm-hmm. So is she creating another parallel timeline mirror universe? I, I you know, I, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what's going on. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm wondering too. Is this a new timeline or is this almost like a holodeck type situation where it's not really real? It's almost like she's dreaming this or having a chance to prove to herself to handle history in a different way. And that helps to cure her or does something for her character. But I'm going to go with she is actually creating a new timeline. I'm not sure at this point, you know, it could be a number of different things. I feel like there's a reality to this. I don't think it's all in her head, although that's a possibility. I don't think it's an illusion, although that's a possibility. I I think this is on some level of reality, whether it's going to stick, whether this is, you know, a new timeline that is going to change something fundamentally about her character, or if it's going to be something that is going to make her come to a realization that I, I don't know. I, I'm really not sure at this point where it's going to go. And and again, I'm loving that feeling. Like, I feel like we've come out of a bunch of episodes of Discovery with me saying like, oh, I think it's going to go here and I think this is going to happen. This time I'm like, wow, I, I have no idea. <laughs> and for somebody who likes to make those speculations and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's disconcerting because, wow, I didn't think it was going to go here and I have no idea where it's going. So, yeah. Well, I know one thing that I was hoping to see because when Captain Killy is talking to Emperor Giorgio about what Burnham is up to and she mentions Lorca, I was like, will we see Lorca? Will we see Lorca? Yeah, you can never have enough Lorca for me. Lorca was like the, I mean, there were lots of really great things about season one, but uh, Lorca was, I, I, I just, 
that was what I loved about him was like exactly what you're saying. You come in every week and you wouldn't know what he was going to do. Is he good? Is he bad? Is he what? I, I implore them to come up with uh, good reasons to see Lorca again in uh, Strange New Worlds. The prime Lorca, he could still be alive. He could still be alive for sure. Yeah, I'd be thrilled to see Jason Isaacs in Star Trek again. Absolutely. I'm sure he'll pop up somewhere at some point, hopefully. It makes sense. It makes sense. But they really didn't plan it. I mean, they, you know, when he was gone, they're like, no, he's dead. And people are going, no, no, he's he's really, really good. He really shouldn't be dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know whether they took that on board. I know they I know they certainly heard it. But uh, it definitely was not the plan that the Prime Lorca was still kicking around somewhere. Well, in this episode, we got to see the return of Landry. We haven't seen her in a while either. So that was kind of cool to see her there on, in the party scene. And uh, Arium, I'm, I'm told, in the background as well, too. It's kind of yeah. cool. Well, it was the, I saw the actress, both actresses who played Arium were there. Yeah. yeah. So I guess in this timeline, uh, she didn't get the augmentation is my guess. Yeah. Before we jump over to the more dramatic things that happen, I want to touch a little bit more on uh, Saru. You know, in this mere universe, I like how Giorgio saves Saru's life from Burnham and how she's more sympathetic about him and wanting to protect him and then wants to use him as a spy. I really like that aspect of the story. What do you guys think? That whole scene with Giorgio and uh, Saru was really fascinating and and one that I really want to sit down and, and watch again really carefully because this is where we see the biggest change that has been uh, made to Giorgio and, and her experiences and that sort of thing and her kind of gut reaction to save Saru from Burnham and, and what that all leads to. I, I think I think we're seeing the seeds here of the redemption arc for Giorgio. Like, pretty clearly that's what this is all kind of kicking off. So uh, that particular scene between her and Saru in private as well, I think was just really well acted by two incredible actors. I, I don't know what the implications are going forward and, and like what's all going to play out in part two, but they're setting up some really interesting stuff here. Yeah. I, mean, I, I agree. It's clearly trying to, to show something about how she's changed. I mean, I, I think, again, it goes back to what I was saying about the, the nature of the mirror universe. Is are, are you bad for the sake of being bad? Or are you trying to achieve a goal in, in a bad place? And I guess, you know, maybe Giorgio's experiences in the prime universe, I was going to say our universe, have shown her that you don't always have to do the, the bad thing. You don't have to eat people if you don't want to. Basic level of, uh, of ethics. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to eat people. Well, I like the rest of this then with Burnham and Giorgio and just, I have to say, Burnham scares the crap out of me. And Giorgio used to, but I'm not, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say she's getting more weak. I think she's getting more crafty. She's getting more smart too and more clever on how she's going to do things. And of course she has the advantage of knowing what happens in the future. But Burnham, man, she's really out to get Giorgio. And I mean, Sonequa Martin Green's performance just is incredible, in my opinion, because I mean, she scares the crap out of me. I don't want to see that every week from her. I saw somewhere online, somebody said she went full Joker this week with, yeah. with the, the mirror Burnham. Uh, and yeah, oh, the, the, the like huge grin straight on to the camera. That was frightening and really well done. Yeah, you don't want to be on the wrong side of her. You definitely don't want to be on the wrong side of her. I think that's true in both universes. They did talk about that, you know, the similarities between the versions of yourself. You know, if you think back to Mirror Mirror, you know, the Spock in the Mirror Universe is still kind of recognizably our Spock, even though he will agonize people. I guess the Kirk we see come over is just a bit kind of ranting madman. I think that's probably one of the weaknesses of Mirror Mirror is you never got to spend any time with uh, Mirror Kirk, who must have been a pretty sharp guy. But yeah, those similarities, you realize that she's got that kind of strength of will. And obviously she's, she's super intelligent and all of that. But I guess she's the same person, just in a different environment. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, the fight in the gymnasium earlier, Giorgio points that out, that you're pretty much the same person. It's just one admits to it and the other one doesn't about them trying to bend the rules. I mean, it's 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 still a really interesting point. Is you know, would we all become would we all become Nazis if we were in Germany in the nineteen thirties? I'm not. I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting one. So I really then like towards the end we get that whole christening of the Charon scene with the whole performance going on and Stamets up there, and uh, then of course Giorgio in that great outfit and that headpiece, 
and the Charon sun just like that energy ball just shining through her headpiece as she's standing there on stage. I, you know, that's the one thing I do want to call out real quick is not just the performances, but the directing of this episode and those shots were brilliant. Mm. I mean, I really enjoyed the directing of this episode. And especially even in this scene, we've got all the characters there assembled together through this whole big dramatic performance. And then when she stabs Stamets, I'm like, yes. I mean, not that I've wanted to see Stamets stabbed at any point. (laughs) But this one I did. That's interesting for the implications, of course, because like that's the moment, I think, where like for sure history has changed if this is in fact actual real life and that kind of thing because we of course saw Stamets uh, alive later aiding Lorca and Landry in, in their coup attempt and stuff so yeah that's an interesting moment you know just for the the larger narrative but also a really interesting moment within the context of this episode because of uh, Sinequa Martin Green's reactions as Burnham and her facial acting through this whole part, I thought was just brilliant and terrified slash angry slash I don't know what towards Giorgio because obviously Giorgio knows what's going on and 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 preempts this attempt on her life and stuff. So I'm I'm really curious how that part of the story went in the the original timeline though. Just like, how did Stamets and Giorgio both get out of that alive the first time around? I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah, maybe she just stands in a slightly different place and Stamets doesn't have the chance. Or maybe maybe the move it comes a little bit earlier and Stamets never, you know, he never gets to be top of the list of people who's trying to kill her. Maybe what could have happened is that Michael could have tried to kill her sooner. Oh, wow. I had, Dan, you know what? That was a very good question. Now I'm really, my head's spinning on that one. Yeah, what happened before? (laughs) And to your point, Ben, yeah, I mean, the timeline has already changed, I guess, in a sense. But did it change it that much to, did they not attempt to do anything at that point? Or did it play out a little differently? Oh, man. Okay, yeah, I have to think about that. Or is it the same timeline at all? Or is it just some kind of, um, you know, Jedi tree experience? Right. Now I'm starting to lean that direction again. No, because <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's a new timeline. Now I'm like, well, I'm not, I don't know. I'm so confused. So yeah, timey-wimey, whatever. But who knows what really happened? We'll have to get a comic or a novel to find out, I guess. So, And we'll cover that here on the show, like we always do. We'll have the author on that to discuss that. Um, I like it, too, then, when Georgia returns to her throne and Burnham is just sitting there, just you know, boiling, like, uh, you know, but what does she do? She stands up and salutes her and everybody salutes Giorgio. I was like, Ooh, there's more to come, of course. And then of course, when we get in the corridor, we find out there will be more to come in part two. How'd you think this ended, Dan? Did you like how the, the corridor scene played out and the sword that just almost took off the head of Burnham, but she decided not to. And that really changes the timeline. Yeah, this is the scene where we get that terrifying performance by Sinequa Martin-Green as the Mirror Burnham as well. And and yeah, the the stopping the sword just in time, like absolutely before taking her head off and, and all of this and changing the timeline as she says, you know, she knows how the story ends. You die, I die, all of this happens, but now it's unwritten. Now who knows what's going to happen and also the other thing is the looks on the faces of Giorgio's people, because this is so unprecedented that Giorgio is allowing Burnham to live. There's definitely a weakening of her control over her people there, which I think is going to play a big part as well. We'll find out in the next episode. I saw a little scene that picks up right after this. So yeah, this definitely is going to play out. But then, you know, there's other things in this episode we didn't touch on, just really other some quick bits here. But we had uh, some scenes with Adira and Stamets. I feel like we're going to get more of that sometime later. So that's establishing that and how Cleveland Booker is on Discovery is talking to Saru about having some kind of role there. And then Owo and Reese having their battle in the Mirror Universe was quite interesting, too. So, Ben, what did you think about any of those scenes? Um, I really like Adira, a really interesting character we haven't seen before. It's a kind of slightly different kind of attitude as well they are super smart so that that I, I find really interesting um i was pleased to see that the the signal from from the nebula wasn't 
any of the obvious things that everyone had been speculating about. That's that's good to see. And I kind of thought they wouldn't go that way because they they there are a couple of times they've had that opportunity to do the the thing that everybody knows and they haven't. They've very deliberately not done it. So I, I like all of that. But I, yeah, I mean, all of that stuff I, I really liked. And I, I felt like it's giving us a, a different beat to what we're used to. You know, it's a, it's a different feel, different kinds of characters. Yeah, and the other scene uh, I just remember is Saru seeing that distress call from another Kelpian. That was a good touching scene too. Yeah, I mean, the fact that he obviously, you know, being a Kelpian is, is quite meaningful to him. And that, uh, you know, at that point, I guess he was the only Kelpian in Starfleet. Well, we know he was the only Kelpian in Starfleet, probably the only Kelpian he'd seen away from their home planet. So, yeah, it's quite a big deal if you discover that, you know, you're because you, I guess he's been looking around for his species and hasn't seen any Kelpian. Yeah, that was a really touching scene. And, and that look on Saru's face as, you know, the implications kind of open up to him. I thought that was really good. I really like that scene between Saru and Book as well about him uh, kind of having to prove himself and I think Saru's giving him a chance here to you know find that moment that he's going to prove his worth and and I think that's going to happen obviously I think Book's going to be a good asset to have you know maybe not working completely within Starfleet protocols as Saru says but he will prove that uh it's it's worth keeping him around and, and having those resources of the courier uh, network and all that stuff as well. And the other way around as well, you see how how people who are initially dismissive of the Federation and of Starfleet kind of hang around for a while and go, oh, actually, okay, I kind of see what you guys are about here. Maybe I should get on board with this, which is the reverse of the mirror universe. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, we're in the final thoughts section here of the show, and I will say that this episode really ranked up high for me. So many episodes have, but I was literally on the edge of my seat at some point towards the end of the episode, and that rarely happens. I was just like really leaning in into this. And yeah, to Dan, your point... I was surprised by so much. There was so much in here I didn't know what we were getting, what to expect, and it was just leading us down that road. I'm really anxious to see the second episode of this two-parter. So, Dan, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Yeah, I think uh, very much the same as you. I'm I'm really excited to see what happens next. There's just so much crammed into this episode. I think I was really surprised when we never returned to the Prime Universe after Giorgio steps through that door. We don't get anything else. We're just 100% in the mirror universe in, in Giorgio's experiences here. You know, it, it does, like you said earlier, feel like kind of two episodes smushed together. And, uh, but it, but it really works. There's so much in this show, but it, it really holds together really well. And, and like you, I'm so fascinated to see what happens next. So, uh, yeah, I have to give this, I think, I'm, I think I'm going to give it one really incredible, overly theatrical, acrobatic performance detailing the rise of Emperor Giorgio. That's my rating. Wow. Yeah, because I'm going to give it uh, multiple crossovers from universes and timelines, and it's just so much of it that I'm confused that I'm just falling apart over it right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ben, what are your final thoughts? I think uh, two parts you can never really judge until you've seen the second part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's all, for me, it's all about the payoff. It's like, this is great, but where they're going. And it's great that we don't know. You know, I, there's a Christopher Nolan thing where he said, you know, I don't want you to know, I want you to, to doubt what's going to happen. And as, there, as anyone writing or crafting something, that's really important. Because we've all seen, you know, so many things so many times. So I think it's great that we don't know quite what's going on or where it's going to go. But uh, let's let's wait for the payoff. Let's see whether it's satisfying. That's that's. But that's a good place to be. You know, you really want to see next week's episode. Well, we'll be discussing that week's episode when it comes out here on Positively Trek. So in the meantime, Ben, where can people find you online if they want to follow you? Uh, Twitter is probably the easiest place. So I'm uh, BCS Robinson on Twitter. Um, or if you look for Hero Collector and me, you'll you'll find I'm Ben Robinson. So you'll find us. We're uh, we're around. Great. And then we're going to have you on our next episode that comes out tomorrow. And we're going to discuss about your new book, Star Trek Voyager, A Celebration. So I'm looking forward to that. And Dan, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube.com slash Productions, Instagram, Kurtrats47, 
all kinds of places. Just search Kurt Ratz. It's probably me. Yeah, that probably is you. It's not me for sure, because I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, and you can find me even on Instagram at Admiral Rex, no underscore, and occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast. And of course, always here on Positively Track, and you can follow us on Twitter at Positively Track. You can find our discussion group on Facebook. Just search for Positively Track, and we'll let you into those wonderful conversations that we have there. You can even email us at Positively Track at gmail.com. So thank you everyone for joining us. Ben, thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next episode, Ben and all of you listening. Stay positive. Stay positive.